So every scare story we hear about sea level rise and the destruction of atoll nations such as we have in the Pacific is wrong. It is absolutely, totally wrong. My guest today is Ian Plymer. How can we use geology to find resources which we need? So uh, I'm, I'm like if you have the geologist, you come to an outcrop and you look at layered rocks, maybe sedimentary rocks, and you think, well, what were the conditions that this formed under? Was it marine? Was it on the land? Was it in a lake? Um, was it in a delta? And you immediately start to think about climate. You immediately start to think about water depth, sea levels. Uh, what was the sea level doing? And American petroleum geologists about 50 years ago worked out a way of walking through a sequence of rocks or looking at a sequence of drill core and working out what sea level was doing. And just by looking at a sequence of rocks where you would be looking at a modern setting going from a beach into underneath a wave base and then offshore a little bit, you can work out what sea level is doing. And Exxon has been doing that for half a century. They've been looking at where sea level was, uh, what the sea level was doing, and looking for petroleum formation rocks where the sea level was really at the highest. So we geologists have been looking at sea level for a very long period of time. Um, we have records from going right back in the geological literature. And one of the very first geology textbooks ever written was by Charles Lyell in 1833, and then two other volumes came later. And these were used by Charles Darwin. And Charles Lyell was suggesting, well, we have out in the oceans these volcanoes, and as they start to subside, the coral atoll on it grows. And that's the equivalent to a sea level rise. And that was a revolutionary idea. And Charles Darwin chased that up on the voyage that he did around the world in the Beagle and then wrote a book about coral atolls in 1842. And he validated that concept. Now, that was validated again with Professor Sir Edgeworth David drilling coral atolls in Tuvalu in 1896 to 1898. It was validated again with drill holes in the Bikini Atoll for atomic bomb testing. And it was validated again with satellite data, which shows coral atolls are actually expanding. And so every scare story we hear about sea level rise and the destruction of atoll nations, such as we have in the Pacific, is wrong. We've had more than 1,100 of these atolls being studied recently. It is absolutely, totally wrong. So on one hand, the climate catastrophists are telling that sea level is rising. Oh, we're all going to drown and be ruined. And uh, on the other hand, those people who are selling snorkels are thinking, wow, I'm going to make some money here. And then we geologists are saying, this is just rubbish. We've known for more than 100 years that sea level goes up and down. We've also known for 200 years that we have climate change. And these climate changes have been very rapid. And the first to recognise this were the French, and they were looking at rocks in the Paris Basin, doing what we geologists do today, looking at the rock, trying to work out, was this in a tropical setting, a polar setting, was it marine, was it shallow water? And they found fossils in these rocks. And these fossils were of tropical plants and tropical animals. And so the French in the late 1700s said, well, the Paris Basin must have once been tropical. They very, very nearly got onto the concept of continental drift. So we geologists have been looking at rocks and looking at outcrops and seeing climate change that's gone on way back through time. And then there have been these massive arguments for 200 years about ice ages. And over Europe and over parts of North America and Canada are these great big boulders that are left there by retreating ice. But in the 1700s, the discussion was, well, are these boulders left behind by the great flood, Noah's flood? Another idea was that these are boulders from warfare between trolls, throwing these great big boulders at each other. And 
<laughs> eventually, I mean, they, 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 the serious geologists of that period of time, like William Buckland, and eventually um, the concept arose that maybe Europe was once covered by ice. And as the ice retreated, it left behind these big boulders which were carried in the ice. And the people who sent this for the Swiss, they were looking at their own glaciers and sort of, hey, wait a minute, this process is happening in our glaciers. What we're looking at in Europe is telling us that we have had ancient climate change and we've had an ice age and ice covered all of Europe. Now, we geologists have been writing about climate change for 250 years. And so we get told by these people who call themselves climate scientists that, what would you know about climate? You're not a climate scientist. Well, look at the background of the people who are frightening us witless. Looking at the background of these so-called climate scientists, most of them are mathematicians and they are dealing with the physics of the atmosphere. They're not looking at the, the rocks. They're not looking at the oceans. They're not looking at the ocean floor. They're not looking at the continents. They're not looking at all the other processes which we geologists have known for hundreds of years have driven climate. So that's why I'm very sceptical when someone calls himself a climate scientist. I think, well, he was an unemployable person um, who's trying to maintain a job through research grants and trying to frighten us witless so we pay more money. So just be careful. Um, when, when people are talking about catastrophism, uh, this is a very old concept in geology and pretty well all the time they have been wrong. So uh, just today, I was looking through my copies of your little green books. I have all three of those, and it looks like you had a lot of fun writing those. You put in some jokes, and you wrote them for uh, different people, right, for little kids and teens and, and adults. Do you want to tell us about uh, writing those books and what that was like? Well, these were written under interesting circumstances. Um, there are three little green books. The first one here um, is for ankle biters, and they're people who are from the age of eight to 12. And you have to think about what do eight-year-olds think is funny. You can't bombard eight-year-olds with science. They don't have the background. Their brains are not mature enough. Now, what makes eight-year-olds laugh and what teaches them things? So I started to, to write about cookies, how you might eat a cookie or, or drink some soda or some water and how your body works. And when you eat a cookie, the carbon in the cookie ends up getting into your body, and from that you grow more cells, and from that you get bigger, and you grow. But there's also some waste, and the waste is poo. The waste is wee. The waste is snot or uh, boogers or earwax and farts. Now, as soon as you mention the word fart or bum, eight-year-old kids just roll around in spasms of laughter. So... I've looked at, at how we could combine the carbon cycle and the concept of net zero with poo and we and farts. And so I'm telling the children to do a few scientific experiments. For example, I'm just reading from the book now, count the number of times you fart in a day. You also fart when you're asleep. Are you an A-grade farter with more than 20 farts a day? So this is to teach kids that there is a cycle of carbon. And if you start talking about net zero, then that concept is ridiculous. And what it means is that if you have net zero, if you have no carbon, if you have no carbon dioxide, then you have a problem. So I've got a little section here starting with, without carbon, there is no life. No plants, no animals, no food, no you. And if you think carbon is pollution, stop eating and you'll drop dead. There's no such thing as carbon pollution. So this is to get the kids thinking about the normal food and drink they have, how they grow, what they throw out as waste products, and, of course, a few little health warnings. That poo is full of viruses and bacteria and, and parasites. You don't want to touch it. That's why you wash your hands. Uh, the difference between a cow's stomach and a human stomach and... Um, trying to tell these little kids, the youngest ones of the lots, well, you know, maybe maybe things you're getting told are a little bit different. Maybe when someone is telling you that the world's going to end or that there's a climate emergency or a climate crisis, maybe they're telling stories. You don't want to be 
telling eight-year-old children that people are telling you lies, but maybe they're telling you stories just to make themselves look important. And then I finish this book by saying, when someone tells you the world will end because of human emissions or a climate crisis, tell them what you think using your own emissions. Fart or burp loudly. So I'm trying to get kids to be a little bit rebellious, a little bit sedition, this book is, but teaching them about body functions and how everything they, they hear about carbon pollution is wrong. And it's there to frighten them. And the second little green book is for teenagers. And these are um, people who have a different view in, in our Western world. Teenagers will open the door of the fridge and say, ah, oh, there's nothing to eat when it's full. Teenagers will finger wag and will moralise. Teenagers will say, oh, that's not fair. Well, I exploit those things. So in the beginning of this book, I, I go into some of the eco-anxiety that's been thrown at these children. The fact that we're not having more hurricanes. Um, we're not having more hurricanes now. Things are very quiet. Things are quieting down. Um, the number of wildfires has decreased over time, that droughts uh, are, are quite cyclical, that if you live in a floodplain, there's something that's going to happen. You're going to get flooded. So this is to try to kill off all the scare stories that these kids have been taught about climate-related disasters. So little graphs in there showing that the number of hurricanes has decreased. That, in fact, if you look at global uh, burned areas, that has gone down over more than 100 years. And in fact, bushfires and wildfires, they're not started by climate change. They're started by arsonists. They're started by spiking machinery. They're started by power lines. Some of them are started by lightning, but they're not started by climate change. So this is trying to use basic logic and to point out that the forests have been in the past well managed. I talk about the recent uh, Hunga Tonga um, eruption in Tonga in 2022 and how that was a very, very large submarine volcano. Now, most, most volcanoes blast about 25 cubic kilometres or 30 cubic kilometres of rock, which gets pulverised and blasted up about 25 or 30 kilometres in the atmosphere. Volcanoes are cracking tower for example. Not the small Mount St. Helens, but Krakatoa was a decent volcano, or Tambora in 1815. And 1816, right across the Northern Hemisphere, it was a year without the summer. But I talk about this Hunga Tonga eruption in Tonga in 2022. And how that was a submarine volcano. And that blasted a huge amount of water right into the stratosphere, 50 kilometres up into the stratosphere. And how now more than 10% of the water in the stratosphere is actually from that one volcano. And this is why we've been having rain bombs and very, very heavy snowfalls. And we never hear about this. We never hear about these unusual events um, of changing the weather. They might not change the climate, but they certainly change the weather. And I come into using the word unprecedented. And the word unprecedented, you have to be very careful about using that word. And I say, look, there's only one thing that is unprecedented in the history of the planet, and that's the appearance of life. Um, we've had a couple of attempts uh, probably to have life, but life only uh, was preserved once. Uh, we've had a couple of attempts to for multicellular life, and then we got it right. So when people talk about a flood or a big rainstorm uh, or a drought, it's not unprecedented. Just look back in the past. And I go back into the past, there'll be a temperature. And you're not living in times that are unusual. It's quite boring, the times we live in. You're not living in times where there's runaway warming. That's not the case at all. We're actually living in an ice age. Now, that ice age started 34 million years ago. We've been cooling for 50 million years. And that ice age started 34 million years ago. And in that ice age, we have periods when the ice expands, and that's a glaciation, and when it contracts, and that's an interglacial. Our last glaciation started 116,000 years ago and stopped 14,700 years ago. 
And since then, we've been in an interglacial. And we were at the peak of this interglacial 7,000 to 4,000 years ago. For the last 4,000 years, we've actually been cooling. And we've had warm spikes, like in Minoan times, like in Roman times, like in medieval times, and like now. And we've had cool times, like in dark ages, and like the Little Ice Age. So in this second volume, the aim has been to try to persuade kids that if you look back in time, then all the things they're trying to frighten you about just don't exist. But I, I wind in a bit of humour there, so I go into the, the coldest period of the Little Ice Age, and that was in the Maunda Minimum some 350 years ago. This is when we were out there killing witches. This is when we were out there hunting down witches because we all knew that the bad harvests were due to witches. We all knew that witches um, caused this bad weather. We couldn't eat. We starved. So we went out and killed the witches. And there's a wonderful correlation between killing witches and temperature. And as soon as we stopped killing the witches in the uh, late 1600s, what happened? Temperature went up. So it's obvious that the witches were causing climate change. And so um, I'm trying to, again, show the kids that there's a, there's a lack of logic in a lot of what they're being told. And I point out that, aren't you lucky? Aren't you lucky that today you're living in a period when the whole world has gone nuts? You know, not many people live in a period of time when everyone goes nuts. The last time was in the Dutch killer craze from about 1634 to about 1640. And during this time, people would spend up to two years' salary to buy just one bulb. And Holland, suddenly, the bubble burst, and Holland went from being the richest country in the world to one of the poorest. So that was a period of time in Holland when everyone went nuts. And you're so lucky that in today's world, you are living in a period where everyone's gone nuts. And aren't you lucky to live in this period of time? Because when we go right back in time, we go back to the last 500 million years, uh, for 80% of the time, it's been warm and wetter than now. We've had at least six great ice ages. And each one of these started when there's more carbon dioxide in the air than now. We've had and great mass extinctions, five great mass extinctions of life. And this is when you get more than 75% of life wiped out. We've had minor mass extinctions also. So I'm pointing out, you're very lucky. It's been boring times, but you're not getting mass extinctions. Uh, you're not getting um, uh, the, the climate runaway as, as we've never seen before. You are living in very, very stable times. So this book is the second book for teenagers is basically to reassure children that things are okay and that carbon dioxide is plant food, not a poison. Uh, carbon dioxide, although you can't see it or taste it or smell it, it's out there and plants use it for food. Now, if it was a poison, you can put it to the test. And I show that you're breathing 0.04% carbon dioxide and you breathe out 4%. Now, let's put that to the test. If that carbon dioxide is poisonous, go and find somebody you don't like. Give them a huge kiss because they're getting 4% carbon dioxide. They don't die. So it's obvious that it's not a poison. And I also warn them, don't, don't try to give your, your dog a kiss, otherwise you'll get licked. You know, the dog, dogs like licking people because uh, that's what dogs do. So I've got a little did you know there, little... Uh, drop downs uh, written in the style of, of trying to keep teenagers entertained. But the the second point I really deal with is is that of morality. And why should you, as a Western teenager, have a refrigerator? Most of the children in the world don't have a refrigerator. Why should you have heating or cooling and or electricity used for cooking in your house? Because there's two billion people in this world that cook using twigs and leaves and donkey dung, and they live in small huts. The fumes given out kill their mothers. They kill people your age. So why don't you really push hard for these people to get cheap, reliable electricity, which we get from coal? Why don't you do that? Why, why are you letting these kids die? Um, I, I look at 
how some children are out there working in deep mines in the Congo, working underground and in open pits, mining the cable. So you can use it in your mobile phone. So you can use it in a cell phone, use it in your electric vehicle. Now, when you swan around feeling morally superior, driving an electric vehicle, kids have died. Kids your age have died to produce the commodities for that vehicle. And so you really have to start looking at your life. What do you use? Do you use a computer? Do you use a fossil fuel driven vehicle to get to and from school? Do you have a cell phone? Do you eat hot food? Do you have air conditioning? Do you walk everywhere? Do you have heating in your house? So these are posing some moral questions to the children. And um, this is to try to get them to think. And the third one of the little green books is basically a short history of the planet. And just showing that we've seen it all before. Don't try to frighten me with fractions of a degree Celsius temperature change. I go into environmentalism. These wind turb turbines have blades from balsa wood that you get with resins, uh, a chemical which is in some of those resins is bisphenol A. And that chemical is banned in most Western countries. That chemical is extremely poisonous. And when we finish using that turbine blade after a short period of time, maybe 15 years or so, we cut up those turbine blades, we bury them. The bisphenol A leaches out into the soils and into the water. Is it environmentalism that when the bat flies near the tip of a blade, and they do, they go from the low pressure to the high pressure areas, that their lungs explode? Is this environmentalism? Should we really be getting our electricity from wind? Should we really be getting our electricity from solar when the solar panels are made by slave labour in China? If you, if you want solar panels, you are supporting slave labour. Is that a moral position to take? Uh, should you be using um, solar power when the solar panels are put on prime agricultural land, when the solar panels have lead and cadmium and selenium and tellurium that leach out into the soils and the waterways? So I go into um, the so-called environmentalism that we have, are now destroying the environment. Really, should we be stopping people in the third world getting to the same standard of living we have. And the third book is, again, to make people feel a little bit uncomfortable and to make them think. So this trilogy was written earlier this year. This trilogy um, is aimed for, at parents and grandparents to be reading to their children or if their children are big readers themselves, for them to read it. So it, it's aimed at a market which I've never really looked at before. Previous books have been scientific texts. These books have got all the science underpinning them, but these books are aimed at young people because our children at schools today are suffering child abuse. They are being told material that is demonstrably wrong, and if they have to write an essay on climate, they write what the teacher wants them uh, to think. They, they write uh, what the teacher wants to hear. They don't write the truth. So children are being taught to survive in this world. You have to tell lies. And that, for me, is too much. Are you uh, speaking in public a lot these days? It sounds like you're uh, on tour and, and uh, talking to audiences. Yes. Uh, I'm talking to audiences in uh, Western Australia. And then I flew the five hours across to Eastern Australia to give a few talks in this last week. How has the audience reception been, then, as you've been traveling around I get very large audiences, but these people have already made up their mind. These people don't have my scientific training, and these people are very, very happy to get the reassurance from a scientist that they actually worked out from common sense. And um, common sense is not very common at all. And these people are mainly in rural areas, and these people observe what's happening around them. Their fathers and grandfathers have told them what it was like farming or working 50 or 100 years ago. A lot of young children today have no practical life experience from outdoors. What they do is that they get their life experience from a screen in an apartment. They don't actually fall out of trees and break their arms. They don't uh, get chased by a boar. They don't uh, get into the farmyard and get covered in, in cow poo. Um, and so the aim of these books is, is to 
teach city kids about how the world really works. I've been talking mainly in rural areas, and of course the population is uh, very different from those in city areas. Okay. Uh, how about your coverage in the press? Are you still portrayed as uh, being anti-science and uh, get any positive coverage at all? Uh, I'm absolutely totally cancelled. Um, uh, cancelled in the mainstream media, cancelled in the mainstream uh, media, be it newspapers or radio or television. I do get um, quite a bit of airtime on things like Fox, uh, Sky, but in effect, uh, there is an attempt to deny me oxygen. Now, that doesn't work because most of the books I have written on climate had been bestsellers. People buy them and they pass them on to other people. Um, the people I, we had someone last night in uh, just north of Brisbane at, on the Sunshine Coast. He bought 400 copies of the Little Green Book, 400 of them. He was on a mission. And so my typical buyer will buy one book and then we'll go back, read it, and come back and buy another three or four and spread them around the family. So I don't really need the press uh, to be promoting anything I do but they attacked me. Now, I had a couple of amusing attacks. Uh, I had um, a fact check done on Facebook of the Little Green Book. And that fact check was done while the book was being printed. There was no way in, uh, they could have seen that book. And it was just a fabrication. And they claimed the book was a fraud. Only three people had seen it. They hadn't seen it. There's no way they had seen it. But no, they had, they had to publish that this was a fraud. I then had a newspaper network have a go at me. Well, that's just fabulous because that's telling people there's a book coming out. I like that. I think that's that's wonderful. Uh, and so I get a lot of attacks. Uh, a lot of them come um, through the social media and, and basically I keep off social media. How do you see the climate debate progressing from here? Do you think that the good guys are winning or uh, what are we going to see over the next 10 years in this debate? There's never been a climate debate. There's never been a situation where scientists at my level will debate an equivalent who is pushing the other side of the agenda. That's never happened. And um, that uh, is obvious why it hasn't happened, because we just wipe us all with them. Um, and especially the case with geologists. People just don't want to argue with a geologist. So we've never had a debate. But the average person now is finding that the gasoline prices are going up, the electricity bill has got higher. If you're working for a, a Ford or, or, or General Motors or Volkswagen, you're out of a job. Uh, I think people now who are feeling a, a financial pinch are saying, well, wait a minute, um, I wonder if everything we're being told is correct. So this will never be driven by science. Um, the whole story of climate change has got nothing to do with science. It's got nothing to do with the environment. It's got nothing to do with climate. It's all about a new method of parting you and your money. This is what it's all about. It's all about unelected elites having power over you and, and taking your money. It's about destroying the middle class such that we have serfs and the elites. It's about depopulating the planet. It's a new eugenics movement. So this has got nothing to do with climate, but people are now starting to think, well, maybe this is not right because their costs have gone up enormously. Once they had cheap, reliable electricity, now they don't. The only thing that's happened is that we've had renewables come into the equation. And the only thing about renewable energy is that the subsidies keep coming. They're renewable. They keep coming every year. So I think there's a very, very slow change. They go nuts very quickly, and they one by one, they slowly come out of being nuts. So we could speed it up with a depression or a recession or even a war or a couple of those put together. But um, I think there's a change happening now. Just people are bleeding. People, people's costs have gone up to it. It's just impossible now. Okay, so you think it's... Uh basically pocketbook issues that are going to win the day rather than the, any sort of battle over science because the public is interested. Very much in so. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing to do with science. It's, it's, this, is, this is a power grab.
Uh, speaking of power grabs, uh, what do you think about the movement to uh, like 15 minute cities? Is that uh, going to happen in Australia where they divide the cities up into sectors uh, because of climate change reasons, anything like that? Well, there have been whispers about it and some local governments have spoken about it. But again, this is a method of trying to control you. This is a method of trying um, to keep you all cooped up in the cage so you are controlled. And all you've got to do is just open your pocketbook, pay and shut up. And that's what it's about. Now, someone in my job, uh, I have to travel a lot. The rocks don't come to me. If I'm a geologist, I've got to go somewhere to those rocks. So for many, many jobs, it's not going to work. If you're sitting at home and designing a web page uh, as your job, then yes, you might be able to be confined to a small 15-minute city. But in Australia, there has been some discussion about it. But uh, in Australia, like in the US, uh, we, we are spread out over a very, very large area. Like in the US, we have um, a large number of people uh, living in rural areas and a 15-minute city just wouldn't work. We just wouldn't be able to get food into the city. We wouldn't be able to get people uh, to work. So there have been, there've been attempts in the big cities, but um, not everyone sits in their apartment all day, every day. Some people actually have to do things and get outside. There's one fundamental point. No one has ever shown that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. It's never been shown. And perish the thought, but imagine that I'm wrong. Imagine human emissions do drive global warming. Well, human emissions are 3% of the total. So you'd have to show that the 97% of natural emissions don't drive global warming. That's never been done, and it can't be done. So the whole basis of the scare campaign that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming is absolutely and totally unproven. It's not been shown. And from all of that, we've had scare campaigns, we've had public policies, we've had um, alternative energy come out and alternative to energy. We've had the killing off of coal-fired power stations. We've had the killing off of, of a certain um, agricultural industries. We've had an attack on industries that might use fertilizers and energy. Uh, we've had an attempt to completely change the way the Western world works. This, this has got nothing to do with science. This is a cancer that's within our society that's eating us away and destroying us from within. So the only really fundamental thing to uh, remember is that no one has ever shown that human emissions drive global warming. So everything else is, is not necessary. We don't need to have more expensive power by closing down a coal-fired power station. We don't need to stop using gasoline-driven vehicles. We don't need to kill off agriculture because of the amount of energy that goes into making our food. Excellent. Okay, I'm looking at uh, one page in your book that lists, uh, I think, 11 different natural climate cycles going from maybe 400 million years in length all the way down to 11 years in length. Uh, do you think that those can be used in any way to try to figure out what's going to happen between now and 2100 or 2200? Or are we just going to have to wait and see what happens? We can use those cycles. We can't use the 400 million year tectonic cycle um, because we have a continent, Antarctica, that's been stuck at the South Pole for a long period of time. Previously, it was a supercontinent with bits of it, India and Southern Africa and uh, Madagascar and Australia and South America joined on, but it's Gondwana's it's broken up. But we've still got Antarctica there. It's trying to break up. And underneath the Antarctic ice, we have about 150 hotspots and volcanoes. So that 400 million year cycle is one that we can't use to show that climate in your lifetime is changing. The 143 million year cycle, and that is where we have a bad galactic address is also one that we can't use in our lifetime. But we have other cycles that we can measure. Uh, we have orbital cycles, and uh, the main orbital cycle that affects climate today is a 100,000-year cycle, where it's for 90,000 years, where it's a little bit further away from the sun, and for 10,000 years, we're a bit closer. Now, we are coming towards the end of one of those 10,000-year periods. So you can expect to have variability increasing and you can expect cooling. 
So that uh, might well happen in your life, but I suspect that it won't. Um, you're not going to live that long. But what we do have are the cycles which are important. We have a um, an oceanic cycle, which is every 60 years. Now, you really have to go through a couple of cycles in your life. Uh, you're not going to live to 180 years, so that one we can not have as a, a lived experience. We have a lunar tidal node where we push warm water into the Arctic, and that one we see um, changes in the Arctic sea ice, and that cycle we live, and we can measure it and we can see it. Um, we can look at the other Arctic cycles, such as the Oceanic Cycle, by looking at history. Every time the Northwest Passage was open, about on 60-year cycles, people could, could traverse around the north of Canada. Now, um, that's probably not in your lifetime, but the real cycles that are important are the solar cycles. And we have solar cycles that are multiples of um, 11 years, and these solar cycles we measure. We can measure them from the amount of radiation coming out of the sun, and that's all the radiation, that's just not light. We can measure them from the number of sunspots on the sun, and we've been measuring that with telescopes for 350 years or so. And there is a very, very strong influence of the sun on our climate. Well, that's no surprise. I mean, that's that great ball of heat in the sky. Of course it's going to affect our climate. And that great ball of heat in the sky um, pulses out energy at different rates uh, and at different times, and these, these cycles change a little bit. So we are now uh, in a period where we've just come out of a grand solar maximum and we have just come into a grand solar minimum. And this has been measured by um, the total irradiance coming from the sun. It's been measured by sunspots. And there's some very good work that you can find that the solar astronomers and solar physicists have done to show that we, again, are cooling. These are cycles, and we've seen these cycles go back hundreds of years, well before humans started to emit carbon dioxide from industry. So uh, the sun is overriding everything that humans do. And in fact, there's great difficulty in actually seeing if humans have at all changed the climate, because uh, any changes that humans might do are just swamped by the solar cycles. They're also swamped by aberrations of the oceanic cycles and aberrations of uh, maybe tectonic cycles where you have changing of currents on the ocean floor. The currents actually carry heat. Uh, it's not the air that contains the heat, it's the oceans. And so you shift around uh, heat in the oceans and you plonk in a volcano on the bottom of the ocean. That changes where a current flows or how a current flows. So we, we, we might be able to measure those, but really we can measure what the sun is doing and, and what the sun is telling us is that carbon dioxide has little or no influence on the way the climate changes. What do you think about the complexity of the climate in terms of trying to model it? Do you think we'll understand it uh, within the next 100 years enough to be able to model it well, or is it just too difficult? Well... Models undergo a lot of criticism, but we try to create models as a really naive attempt to understand the natural process. And the problem with that is we do not know what natural processes are driving um, certain natural phenomena. We just haven't got enough information. We don't know enough, and we're always getting surprised. So our current climate models are constructed on the basis that carbon dioxide has an influence or drives climate change. Now, these models don't work, and we know they don't work. They overcooked the scene very much so because we've had these models around for more than 40 years. We've had something like 102 of these models, which we've been able to look at over the last 40 years and compare that with measurements of temperature over the last 40 years, and there's no relationship. The models don't work. So the models a fairly naive way of trying to understand the future, trying to predict the future is fraught with all sorts of danger. And, and most of the time in history, people have not been able, been able to predict the future, and especially for models where you're trying to simplify very, very complex processes and you don't even know what some of these processes are. And these are the, the unknown unknowns. 
Uh, you've got enough problem with the known unknowns, but it's the unknown unknowns. And every now and then we have a great surprise in science for something we didn't know and something that may well affect climate and may well even affect their models. Uh, do you think we even understand the carbon cycle itself? Or as another question, uh, if humans didn't exist, uh, what uh, what ppm of CO2 would, would we have in the atmosphere? Is that rise since 1850 in CO2? Was that all humans or was part of that natural? Um, the carbon cycle is very complicated. Humans form a very small part of this carbon cycle. The main... Um, uh, critters that have something to do with the carbon cycle are uh, algal blooms on the ocean, on the oceans, um, especially in, in the oceans to the, in the southern hemisphere. So um, the carbon cycle is, again, a fairly naive way of trying to understand carbon because we're not creating more carbon in our planet. All of the carbon in the planet has actually originally come from the mantle, the carbon dioxide originally came from the mantle, but it's done a few laps through life. Uh, so we don't really understand it nearly as well as we should. We certainly don't know what's happening deep in the mantle and in the core of the Earth. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the floor of the oceans. Uh, we are constantly, again, getting surprised at carbon. We, we really, I don't think, understand carbon in soils. So uh, the carbon cycle, again, is that, a naive way of trying to understand how uh, carbon is neither destroyed nor created. It, it does circuits through various processes on the planet. It goes through at various rates. Uh, these circuits depend very much upon the chemistry of the oceans and the chemistry of the atmosphere, both of which have changed over time. So, again, I think the carbon cycle is a naive way of trying to understand our place on planet Earth. And uh, I'm not so sure that. Humans have had a great influence on the carbon cycle. Yes, of course, we emit carbon dioxide, um, but uh, so do many, many other things on planet Earth. And if you start to look at that 3% of human emissions, then and that figure is probably an overestimation. I suspect it's a lot less. If you look at that 3% of human emissions, that's uh, one molecule of carbon dioxide in 83,333 molecules in air. And if you think that human emissions of carbon dioxide are going to drive climate change, you really should be putting ice blocks in your drinks because they're too strong. One, you're trying to tell me that one molecule of human emitted carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, with another 83,333 molecules, it is that one molecule that drives climate change. So I think you've got to think again. What do you uh, think about the CO2 residence time that if humans do emit one molecule today, uh, on average, how long uh, is that in the atmosphere or how long does it reside there? I've seen numbers from like five years up to um, a millennia. Well, that's a very good question. And that's the key question to the scare campaign. If you want to argue that human emissions of carbon dioxide are... Um, add it to the atmosphere and then stay there for a long time and affect uh, uh, light and heat, oh, and, and again, that's a great contentious argument, then you need a very long residence time. And that very long residence time is used by those who want to scare us. Yet there's a lot of isotopic work and there's a lot of thermodynamic calculations showing that it could be as low as five years. I think it's probably between five and 10 years. And that's because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, is used by plants, it's used by um, algal blooms, it's uh, dissolved in the oceans, and we're constantly adding calcium to the oceans uh, down our rivers and streams, and that then combines with the carbon dioxide that dissolved in the oceans, and we precipitate carbonates, or we have animals use that calcium and carbon dioxide to make shells. So it is a big unknown, but there's a huge debate in science about the residence time of carbon dioxide. Now, most people don't even think of that. Most people think that if we emit that, oh, that dreadful toxic poisonous uh, gas that we can't see, taste or smell, if we emit that in the atmosphere, it's there forever. Well, oh, we're all doomed. That's not the case. It's not there forever, nor is the oxygen. So uh, the inert gases like nitrogen, they're not even there forever. Um, argon, that's not even there forever. So 
um, our atmosphere has evolved. And over time, we've had three different atmospheres. We're living in the third atmosphere, which is an oxygen-rich atmosphere. It is continuing to evolve. So uh, I, I think it, uh, it, it's the basis of the SCARE campaign. You, you have to persuade people, and this hasn't been done scientifically, but you have to persuade people that a molecule emitted by human activity stays in the atmosphere for an extraordinarily long period of time. Uh, maybe then you have to persuade people that an atom, a molecule of carbon dioxide emitted from the oceans doesn't stay in the atmosphere for an extraordinarily long period of time. So th th these are some of the scientific debates that take place that the media never knows about. Have you looked into uh, human uh, weather modification? Like the Independent in 2008 said the uh, weather modification uh, industry in China employed nearly 40,000 people. And CNN last year said that uh, cloud seeding has been around for decades and it's currently uh, being operated in 50 countries. Do you think, uh, what, what's your, your view on that? Is cloud seeding or uh, other weather, weather modification, is that happening on a fairly large scale right now? Well, I'll answer this in two parts. The first part is that humans do change the weather. And we see that from land clearing. That changes local rainfall uh, at Mount Kilimanjaro. That changes local snowfall. So uh, humans can change the weather. And the greatest human activity uh, that can change the weather we know about is actually uh, clearing the land. For more than 70 years, we have been trying to siege clouds uh, and change the weather. Now, I live in a, a continent that's an arid continent. We have got a, a government research organisation here that has been conducting experiments for a very long period of time on seeding clouds with silver iodide um, to have rainfall when and where you want it. Now, that's been a very long and expensive project, and yes, you can create rain, and, of course, if you could create rain on a battlefield and create a quagmire, then you can bog down the enemy. So there are good military reasons for doing this. Um, so with seeding of clouds, there has been partial success, but there are military reasons uh, to try to be successful, and, of course, there are reasons for agriculture. If you could um, have rainfall on your grain crop at the right time, you can be guaranteed of a very successful crop. Um, by contrast, if you live in the desert, uh, you're just dependent upon sporadic rains and uh, you're, you're really trying to control the weather. So it's, it's been something that people have been wanting to do for thousands of years, control the weather such that production can be controlled. But of course, it's always good to have the enemy knee deep in mud. Whose work do you uh, enjoy in terms of uh, trying to understand natural variability? Well, I don't specifically deal with one particular scientist. Um, I, I read widely and generally every morning I spend reading scientific literature and that's before I get on to dealing with emails and all, all the other stuff that I, I have to deal with as part of work. Um, but uh, last weekend I had uh, lunch and a dinner with um, Dr. Will Happer from the US. Uh, he's a physicist and he was talking about aspects of climate, which are very different from the ones I look at. And he's a physicist who has quite independently, uh, using different lines of evidence, come to the conclusion that um, what we're being fed with climate catastrophism uh, is, is demonstrably wrong. Uh, I do read a lot of the isotope work, uh, looking at the um, isotope work, especially uh, the stable isotope work. And I'll be going to Jerusalem fairly soon, and there's the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem that has a, a very, very good isotope laboratory and I need to talk to them. Um, I like to read the archaeological and historical um, scientific work because that then can tie in what might have been tied down time-wise with what might happen with major processes. So I'm, I read very, very broadly and I'm, I'm chasing up a lot of literature at present on tectonic cycles on how you might move continents, um, how volcanoes over periods of time have, have given us extinctions, given us changes in the atmosphere, changes in the oceans. And of course, this will change sea level, this will change the climate. So I, I would regard myself as a polymath. I read very widely. I don't have any special fans that I read, but um, 
I have a very large correspondence. Also, there are a lot of blog sites, uh, material that that I, I get sent to me that I look at, but I just really can't keep up with the reading. It's just almost impossible uh, to keep up, and all scientists will say that. It's just almost impossible. There's just so much material being published everywhere. So, uh, do you think that changes in geologic or volcanic heat might have uh, a major implications to uh, ocean temperatures or climate in general? I think it's something we should be exploring um, because we have these swarms of earth tremors that occur on the mid-ocean regions. And that's when we're getting magma or molten rock pushed aside the other rocks, giving us uh, earth tremors when we're breaking rocks. Now, those swarms of earth tremors are at times we get a warming of the oceans and that warm um, ocean water will rise and that, of course, affects the El Nino La Nina cycle. So uh, that is very interesting. What is also interesting is that I've gone into the experimental petrology and I've looked at people who will get a rock and cook it up under high temperature and pressure and look at how much gas will dissolve in it. And the rocks which are in the Circum Pacific Belt and across the Mediterranean, the, the main volcanic rock there is andesite. And these andesites stick out of the ground and they can dissolve a fairly large amount of water vapour. And when that molten rock starts to rise or water vapour such as from the sea is added to it, as we saw in the recent Tongan eruption, then you will have a flashing of that water. It will suddenly go from dissolved water in a magma to steam. You get a massive volume change. That's an explosion. Now, we have about 1,800 of those volcanoes around the Earth, and we know from the experimental petrology that we can dissolve very little carbon dioxide in an andesite. But when we look at the most abundant volcanic rock, and that is basalt, and our sea floors are covered in basalt, very little water dissolves in basalt. This is why basalt volcanoes are very rarely exposed. You don't hear of great explosions on Hawaii or the Galapagos Islands. You have the occasional one in... in Iceland, but in general, these are not explosive eruptions. But what we do know is we can dissolve about 13.5% carbon dioxide in basalt. So picture the scene. You have a pulling apart of the ocean floors, a depressurization deep in the mantle. That gives you partial melting of the mantle. That partial melt is charged with gases, mainly carbon dioxide, but a little bit of methane and helium a little bit of water, and so it's lighter. And it rises, it rises up fractures, up the edges of rifts. As it comes up towards the surface, it's at 1,100 or 1,200 degrees Celsius, and it's going to erupt onto the sea floor, which is at 2 degrees Celsius. So that rock has to be cooled to be solid. Where does the heat go? It goes into ocean waters. And you can calculate this, and there's been a, chap in the UK, Brian Cat, who's been doing these calculations. But where does the carbon dioxide go? Well, it obviously is released because none of it is in the solid rock. It, so it goes from being 13.5% in a molten rock to virtually 0% in a solid rock. So it clearly goes into the ocean waters. Now, it's not going to bubble up through the waters because the ocean deep waters are cool and they're saline and they're at high pressure. And that's perfect for dissolving carbon dioxide into them. So there's a huge amount we don't yet know about our submarine volcanoes. And I'm exploring that by looking at some of the thermodynamics, going back to some of the experiments, talking to a lot of volcanologists. And I've been working for a long while on volcanic rocks um, and, and their role in various processes. So uh, I just think that's one of the hidden things that has not been looked at. And if we look at the planet, not all the heat that comes into the ocean comes from the sun because our planet is cooling. It's been cooling for 4,567 million years. That cooling at present, 70% of the cooling takes place through the oceans and the rest can, takes place through the continents. That heat has to go somewhere. It just doesn't disappear. So while our planet is losing heat, uh, that heat has got to go into the oceans. We're also adding heat from the sun and we have this um, air conditioner of evaporating and precipitating water. So that part of climate change I'm really interested in. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we do have hidden away in the literature 
all sorts of experimental petrology work. We don't have much sampling on the ocean floor. We have a little bit. We have a little bit of sampling around black smokers and white smokers, and we have a little bit of seismic work, but we just don't have an array of instruments on the seafloor measuring these things. So um, for me, that's one of the big forgotten things. We've forgotten that the fact that the planet is cooling down and that heat has got to go somewhere, most of it into the oceans. So you mentioned that Hunga Tonga eruption, and I was just looking at headlines here saying that blasted an unprecedented amount of water into the stratosphere. Do you have thoughts on how that's going to affect climate over the next two to five years? Yes, we're going to have more rainfall and we're going to have more snowfall. All that water that's in the stratosphere has to come back to Earth. And people come back drop by drop. And, of course, um, we will have flooding and, of course, we will have big uh, rain events. Uh, that's quite normal. When you've got so much water in the atmosphere, it's got to go somewhere. It's not going to go to Mars. It's going to drop back onto Earth. Now, how about uh, temperature effects on Earth? Will that trap trap heat and cause uh, a spike in warming? In the stratosphere, there has been evidence of a little bit of warming from this water. And that's no surprise because the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is not carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, folks. Carbon dioxide is, is, just doesn't really have a part in it. It's water vapour. Water vapour is the main greenhouse gas. And so, of course, that is going to have an effect on um, the stratosphere. But we've also got a lot of particulate matter from volcanoes that gets into the atmosphere, and that has a cooling effect. And to calculate the balance between the cooling and the heating is a very difficult thing to do. And the second thing is these very fine particles of, of pulverised rock in the atmosphere are the nucleus for uh, for nucleation of water vapour into a droplet. So, again, these are things where we don't have too many measurements and we don't really understand it very well. Okay. We are up at the end of our hour here. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? No, not really. I really enjoy your uh, vigorous and rigorous questioning because um, most scientists uh, are like me, that they are always curious and searching. Those people who say the science is settled, they are not scientists. They're pushing the political barrow. And as soon as someone says, well, that's interesting, let's do a bit more work on that. Or as soon as someone says, well, I'm not sure, or I don't know, then you're dealing with true science. As soon as you hear the science is settled, or as soon as you hear the word consensus, it is not science. There is another agenda. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, Ian Plymer, hope to have you back on again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.